everyone. Quick note before we get started. What you're about to hear was recorded on Monday, and it is now Thursday, March 23rd. There were some technological glitches where I wasn't able to save the changes I had done when editing. And maybe it worked out because since the time that I originally recorded it, Nightlight Astrology came out with a fantastic episode that had a lot of relevance to the topics that I discuss. And the name of that, I will put a link in the show notes, but it was called Major Shadow of Pluto in Aquarius. While I was listening to that, I was wondering, oh, this sounds really familiar to me. I looked at my chart and both my IC and my South Node are in Aquarius. So that was really helpful podcast to me. Just make me aware of what could be happening for me individually, as well as for all of us collectively the next 24 years or however long Pluto will be in this sign. But Pluto changes signs today. That's the big, big news in astrology. Uh, another podcast that may not seem quite so readily relevant, but is still fantastic, is an episode that I started listening to today that was released on Barney and Flow podcast called A Convo on Deconditioning, True Hydration, and the Magic of Water with Isabel Friend. It has been a fantastic conversation so far, and it does mention the body's ability to deal with trauma and its resiliency as it relates to the condition of the quality of the water in your body. So I will include the link to that as well. Because I often do talk rather slowly, especially when I am processing things as I talk, I highly recommend that you speed up the video or the audio, depending on whether you're watching or listening. Put it on at least one and a half speed. That will make me feel so much better <laughs> making the most of your time. You'll still get all the great benefits. Just at a faster speed. So those are all of my production notes. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Thank you for joining me for another play date in the sandbox. I am your host for today, April Dawn Scheffler. I want to thank the sponsor for today's podcast. That is going to be me. <laughs> I want to invite you to purchase tickets to the Ecstatic Forest Festival if you are in the Elgin, Texas area. Next month, you can click on the link in the show notes to get more details as to price, ticket prices and dates, etc. But if you have a offering, some type of product or service that you would like featured on this podcast, reach out to me, the sandboxpod at gmail.com. So I am also presenting at that festival. I think I mentioned that before, but I had put in a couple of applications and one of them was accepted. And that is the rewrite your story, literally. And it's based off the process that I used when writing my book, Sandra, A Healing Reimagining of the Babysitter from Hell. It's been really fun. For one thing, trying to put the best parts of that experience into something that's concrete that I can share with other people. Like what were the gems that I gleaned from that experience and how can I do my best to help others reproduce similar benefits in their own experience with everyone's experience being so different? Like how can I even begin to address that or touch it. But I'm going to try, and I think it's going to be a really fantastic workshop. I plan on putting that into a course that people can access online instead of having to travel all the way to Texas if that's not where you live for a once a year festival. Speaking of the presentation, I went back and decided I wanted to readdress the presentation because 
I saw a video on TikTok by a lady named Trudy. I follow her. And she was touching on this topic of, does suffering equate to worthiness? She had heard, like many of us have, we probably tell ourselves a similar version of this story, that I've overcome so much. And I'm thankful for those experiences because it's made me the person that I am. What she was putting in front of her viewers was, we tell ourselves this story, we are the kind of person that we are now because of what we've gone through. She was just suggesting, okay, what kind of person would I be if I had been supported by lots of loving supportive people, people who told me I could do it. And maybe I did not have to go through all of this suffering to get the same result of being a good person. So just revisiting that whole concept, do we hold this subconscious belief that somehow our suffering or our pain, our struggle makes us worthy or that we somehow earn whatever's this thing that we want, this goodness or this satisfaction. And are we allowing ourselves to act from a place of judgment of others who we see as having gained some type of success or happiness who haven't gone through maybe some of the same struggles we have? And it reminded me of the union concept of the golden shadow and how sometimes we keep ourselves small and we put these other people on a pedestal telling ourselves we could never do that. And I think we do that with pain, right? Oh, of course this person is successful and has all of these accolades because they haven't had to endure ABC, right? I have. And so in that way, it kind of gives us a sense of comfort. I did a response video on TikTok, just thanking her for bringing that up because honestly, I haven't come to any concrete conclusions, but this is just me playing with two ideas at the same time, right? I don't think we should invalidate our experiences. And I don't think that's what she was suggesting at all either. The pain, the suffering, trauma, whatever it is, it's real. It's real and it has shaped you into the person you are today. But the thing is, what I got from it is that we are not to attach our worth or worthiness of love or good things based on the struggle it took to get there. To sure, lean into all of the great things that we have learned, maybe the compassion that we've come to embody because we've gone through similar struggles. Lean into those good qualities, the compassion, the love, without identifying so strongly with the struggle that it took <laughs> to get there. And that resonates a lot with me because I think for so long, let me just say something else first. I believe that often whatever way in which we place ourselves as the victim, it is serving us in some capacity. We need to ask ourselves, how is this story I'm telling myself, what is it giving me? Because there has to be a payoff, right? The psyche does not hold on to things that don't in some way protect you. And if I'm clinging to a story of struggle and pain, then what I could be doing is providing myself this comfort bubble in saying that yeah, I wasn't able to achieve this, this, and this because I didn't have fill in the blank. I didn't have the support system. I didn't have the financial resources. I didn't have the love and whatever that I, I needed. 
it can kind of validate any reason I might have to play small or to stay small. And also it can kind of give me this place of, again, judgment of other people who, who I see as not, as having good things just handed to them. <laughs> right? Jealousy is something that I want to release. I want to release my my death-like grip on this identity, the self-identity or this over-identification rather with struggle, with pain. So again, I want to lean into good qualities, the compassion, the understanding, the empathy, some of the resiliency I hope that I have learned. But again, at the same time, providing myself this grace of maybe I didn't have to go through those things to become the person I am today. I don't know. Again, it's just something that I am I'm entertaining and I'm thinking about and I'm letting it sit, sit in my heart because it would be a, a giant shift, right? If I have identified so long as this poor welfare kid with a, a a broken home and who who moved over 30 times in the course of two decades whatever i don't even know if that's true i did i i counted up one time how many times i had moved it was over 30 times where i live now is the longest i think i've been in any one place but yeah i i have this this story and I think it has kept me from really enjoying where I am now because what the fuck? I'm not struggling as much, right? I'm in relationship with my husband who is a rock. He's my rock. He's so he's a rock in all the ways. Like he provides for the family and I have that assurance of no matter what happens, I have this helpmate that is going to make sure we're taken care of. And with me having my Chiron in Taurus, that's something that's really important to me. That I know someone is going to dig in alongside me and make sure that, that we're good. So, um... That story of struggle, how is that informing my current experience? Because if I'm not struggling right now, am I that kind of person that <laughs> I was jealous of before? Or do I somehow think I'm less deserving now of good things, now that I'm not having to struggle so much? And... By readdressing that whole narrative of struggle equals worthiness of love, I am also able to extend this same understanding and compassion and like a level playing field to everybody, regardless of whether I see them as struggling or not, because they're worthiness of whatever success or happiness that they're experiencing is not dependent. It doesn't hinge on what what happened to them to get to this point. I mean, we all love an underdog story, right? It's amazing. But the shadow side of that is that we can resent those who make it to the top or stayed at the top without that underdog story. So yeah, those are just some things that I am dancing with right now. Next thing I wanted to talk about was yesterday, I was able to join the weekly check-in for the Artist Way course that's being facilitated by Mindy Etzer. You kind of talk about your experience for the week. And I brought up one of the tasks that we had been assigned in the book for week two, and that was listing 
of the major things that take up our time in any given week or this last week. And so I wrote them down and then you're supposed to label them either a should or a want. Is this a should or a want? Well, I mentioned that several of the things on my list were both a should and a want. <laughs> and the facilitator, Mindy, she challenged that. The way she phrased it is said that she wanted to stretch me a bit <laughs> on this. But she was saying that it can't be both a should and a want. Okay. <laughs> Here's the example I brought up. All of my daughter's extracurricular activities. It's a want because I, you know, in some way I'm living vicariously through her, um, giving her experiences that I didn't have access to when I was younger. She may be a little overcommitted, but we do honestly address that from time to time. Are you still wanting to do these things? Is there something that you want to give up? So don't think that, that, that she's suffering. Okay. <laughs> but like ballet and Girl Scouts and karate, we stay really busy, but I want her to stay active. I want her to be socialized because she's an only child. And I just want her to have access to things so that she has options to pursue something later down the road that it might be harder to try out when you're competing with people who have been doing it for years, let's say ballet, right? If you don't have a relatively young exposure to that, then the odds of you being able to do that professionally or be involved with any type of production, it's, I don't know, I think it would be limited. I could be completely wrong, but that's my viewpoint on some, certain things, you want to do it while you're young and have this elastic brain, muscle memory, and whatever, if it's playing an instrument, etc. And I kind of lost where I was going with that. <laughs> okay, so I want her to do all those things. However, I also think of it as a should, because if I weren't giving her all of those opportunities, then what kind of parent does that make me? I, I feel like I should be exposing her to these things. I should be making these opportunities available. And so what if that means I find myself in the car driving her a million different places and waiting in the vehicle while her hour, hour and a half long lessons complete? What is a want and what is a should and can it be both? And again, Mindy said it could not be both. So <laughs> I have been becoming a little bit more fluent in the language of paradox, holding two things and letting both be true, entertaining that idea that both are true. So one of the things that came to mind is that Mindy is probably not an Enneagram one. <laughs> and what occurred to me is that maybe I should just change this entire podcast to people who identify as an Enneagram one, because I realized that people do not struggle with the same thing. They just don't. And some of the things that I struggle with other people, it does not translate at all into their experience. It's not even on their radar. As an Enneagram one, if you are one, then you know that should is kind of like the operative word of, of who we are and what we do. Everything's based on should because we're constantly, we have this ideal of of either how things could be or should be that or we at least know how things could be improved how they could be better and that that translates into everything relationships work etc so should is a huge word for 
Enneagram one, we are big on rules. We can even be a rebel in certain ways. But if there is a rule that we deem helpful or beneficial or we see the logic behind it, then it's Bible, <laughs> right? What Mindy suggested was if there's a should that's wanting, that's trying to become a want. Okay, during that part, I'm not even sure I was fully listening <laughs> because I was so blown away by this complete shift. Wow, it, can, it can't be both. And I told her so many of my things in life they fit into both buckets. So as I was going th along through the rest of my day yesterday, I was trying to think to myself, how can I play with this concept? And any time that I find myself or catch myself using the word should in my, my mind talk, that I replace that with I want. And see how that feels in my body. Because if it feels like a lie, <laughs> then it's very likely that I need to eliminate it or find a way around it. For example, if there's something I say I should do and I change it to a want, I should do my taxes this weekend. How about I want to do my taxes this weekend? <laughs> How does that feel in my body? Does that feel like a lie? Then maybe I need to take that off of my list by delegating that to someone else who that does not feel like a lie in their body. There are, we talked about people being different. There are people who do not find doing taxes to be the most soul-crushing thing in the universe. So there are professionals, you know, strangely enough, there are professionals that make it their living, their career to do taxes because numbers are their friends and they just don't see it in the same way that I might. So can I delegate this? One of the real life examples I was able to apply this to was laundry. I'm like, I should do laundry. I need to fold the laundry that's been sitting there in a basket for two days or more. I'm like, can I change this to I want to do laundry? And how does that feel? I do want myself and my husband to have clean clothes that are readily available. So that is true. I want clean clothes that are readily available. So since it's not a, a lie, I ask myself, is there a way I can make it feel even more true? Is there another want that I can stack on top of it? I want to listen to podcasts. That's definitely true. There's no question about it. There are certain podcasts that I really enjoy listening to. So can I stack a really strong want with a with a want that I am now learning with my training wheels to, uh, to play with, to explore. So can I do both? And in that book, Atomic Habits by James Clear, I think it is, you know, he talks about habit stacking, right? So I just kind of put a play on words and do, let's do some want stacking and just eliminate the shoulds. As, as much as possible. When it comes to like cleaning the house, I was like, is this a should or a want? Okay, I want to not be annoyed every time I see this certain thing, okay? And when you get enough of these little irritating eyesores in the, in the house, it does kind of leave you with this unsettled feeling like, like your home is not even a safe place to be. It's not a sanctuary of sorts. So I can rephrase that into, I want my home to feel like a sanctuary. So I've changed it from a should 
into a want? And then can I stack other wants on top of that? I want to rock out to my favorite playlist on Spotify. I want to listen to the latest podcast episode that was released. And then after that, us Enneagram ones, I'm talking to us, just really thoroughly allowing ourselves to be freaking proud of ourselves. Because so much, you know, as an Enneagram one, and I'm going to get, I want to get through an episode without getting emotional, but you know that enough is never enough. That whatever you do, there's something else you can do. It's never enough. It's never good enough. But I'm saying, fuck that. Let's change our shoulds into wants where we can. Eliminate the shoulds that we can't. <laughs> in an, a real authentic way. And then be proud of ourselves for doing that. Because I am by no means a housekeeper. So my inner dialogue would be if I were to sweep and swiffer the kitchen or get rid of those eyesores that were keeping my home from feeling like a sanctuary. I could be like, oh, you know, well, my cousin's wife, she has this Instagram page where it's all about and housekeeping and she does a fantastic job and like holding myself to that standard if i do that there is no celebrating of my small wins and i'm tired of that i want to be proud of myself i want to celebrate the small wins i want to change the narrative i'm telling myself i've heard other people verbalize the self-talk before where nothing can stay nice. Maybe you've heard that before. Uh, nothing can stay nice. I can't keep anything that's nice. Yeah, if we can just celebrate the little wins and not just move on immediately to the next thing, the next mile marker, the next threshold for what we should be doing next, because I think we're constantly moving the mark. As, as Enneagram ones, I'm probably beating a dead horse here, but if we can change the shoulds to wants where we can, where it feels authentic to us, do some want stacking and take the time to celebrate ourselves. We are good people. <laughs> I just want you to hear that. We are good people and we accomplish more than we realize. And yes, we may not, you can fill in the blank, but just give yourself credit and then give yourself a little extra credit because Enneagram ones, you're, you're not going to go overboard with that because you have that inner critic. Don't feel like you're going to get a big head. <laughs> Just really feel satisfaction. I think that's the word that we miss so often. That feeling of satisfaction in our lives is taking the time to not move that marker even further out of reach, but to feel satisfied, feel satisfied with our effort. Like April... You did a good job. You may not have gotten everything done that you wanted, but you accomplished quite a bit. And just give yourself that internal validation, that pat on the back, because I think sometimes we get ourselves so strung out with all these shoulds that we're looking for other people to pat us on the back and to acknowledge and give us that out of girl or out of boy. And when that doesn't happen, we just feel so fried and at our at our wit's end. I'm doing the best I can that when we feel as though people aren't acknowledging that, they're not seeing it, or they're asking us to do even more, <laughs> we 
<laughs> just break. But I think it starts with giving ourselves that internal validation, allowing ourselves to feel satisfaction instead of dissatisfaction, because we are experts on seeing that gap of where improvements could be made, whether it's in ourselves, our relationships, outside systems, etc. So I just wanted to encourage you to do those things. And again, like I said, maybe I just need to change this podcast and market it as an Enneagram One pod. But let me know if any of this resonates with you and you do not identify as an Enneagram One. I still hope that it has been helpful. Lastly, I wanted to address what makes a bad person? What makes for a bad person? And I'll tell you why I bring this up. In the Artist Way programs, a 12-week program, and you don't have to go through a facilitator-led course like I am doing with Mindy. The book itself is divided up into 12 weeks with different tasks to do. So you could do this all on your own. I would love to know if you decide to do that. I had had that book on my bookshelf for a long time because so many people had been raving about it. And when I found it at Half Price Books, I went and bought it, but then it sat on my bookshelf. One of the things, we're in week two now in the program, one of the things that you start from day one are the morning pages. What the morning pages are is simply three pages of longhand writing, the first thing in the morning, where you just do like flow of consciousness writing. I'm tired. I I don't want to be writing my morning pages. Morning pages suck. There are so many things to do today, period, period, period. Oh, I dreamed last night. Um, I think I dreamt about this and that. I wonder what this means. I hope my boss is in a good mood today. Just flow of consciousness things. And you'll be surprised, it says, about what comes up to your attention what was lurking in the back of your mind or that wants to come up and be acknowledged. And it's still early on, but I have found it helpful because I think we want a lot of our relationships outside of ourselves in juxtaposition to our relationship with self. We want a lot of our outside relationships to see and acknowledge the things that we're going through. But this allows you, when you're like me, and sometimes you don't even know what you're feeling, in human design, I have a completely open solar plexus with no activations. So it's like you have no point of reference for what you're even feeling sometimes. This can be helpful to bring up what you're feeling or what you're thinking that you didn't even know was that important to you, but it's coming up to be, to be addressed. In my morning pages, I was talking about a dream I had last night and I couldn't remember very much about it except for, I caught myself using the phrase, the bad guys. I was trying to get away from the bad guys. I mean, this group of people. And then I found myself writing, okay, what makes, What makes someone a bad person? Because it's so easy, right, for us to have the us versus them mentality, whether it's issues on COVID or health or sovereignty or freedom or whatever, abortion, how we decide to punish and imprison people. There is always some type of line that you can draw between us versus them. And some beliefs are held so closely, they're like core value, that um, it's really easy for us to, with a broad brush, paint those other people as bad. So here's the thing. I was talking with... Andrea, the emotion code person last night, and we were talking about how it's, it can be really amazing how in certain circles, it's like a Venn diagram, right? In certain circles, you have similarities with people, but then you'll see them post on social media 
about this really maybe militant, strong belief about something that's kind of at odds of where you see things. And you thought you knew them, right? They were your people. And then all of a sudden, they're putting themselves in this other camp in opposition to you, where they're marking you as a bad person. But are they really bad just because they have a different belief or viewpoint? And here's the thing. This is something that's really new to me. Like I said, I was just writing about this in my morning pages this morning. So I haven't really delved in deep. But what I'm playing with and what I'm exploring is that bad people, at least in the traditional sense, I'm not going to talk about differences in politics or religion and all these other things, which are really core beliefs. But I'm talking about the people that as a whole, we can easily mark as bad. And why can we do that? Because they take pleasure in other people's pain. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> clear cut definition if you don't go into the weeds with it, right? Just from the surface, that would make someone a bad person is taking delight in someone else's pain. Well, just like I explored in my book about the babysitter from hell, when you take the time to ask yourself, what did a person go through to get to this place where we have just conveniently labeled them as a bad apple? What does a person go through to get to that point? And I was wondering if somewhere along the way, pretty early on, there was a split of where it was very clear to that person that being loving was vulnerable. Vulnerable equates to weakness and only the strong survive. And if you have a really clear, clear-cut distinction early on in life, and it's a matter of survival or, and survival can mean different things. It doesn't have to necessarily mean physical survival, but it can. But it can mean survival in terms of acceptance within a group. If your survival, in whatever the context is, is dependent on aligning yourself with strength, with those who are strong, then turning the other cheek, loving, allowing yourself to show sympathy or whatever, that can be a sign of weakness that can leave you vulnerable. People do not want to feel pain. And I think sometimes, I know I've been huh, guilty of this. It's been true for me, where I think if I just close myself off enough, I, I can't be touched by disappointment. I can't be touched by pain. If my heart can just get separated enough from all these things that could cause pain, specifically relationships from, from me, then, then I'll never have to hurt. And lack of pain, we think that equates to happiness when it doesn't it just equates to being numb and really losing that connection to love and life force so i think some of these people who delight in other people's pain or misery it's because it's a type of I couldn't find the word I was looking for. It's not comic relief, but it's relief in that pain being outside of themselves as opposed to being inside of them. I'm not feeling this pain and wow, th that's it's a relief. And as such, it's kind of funny. So Again, I'm not saying that this is how things are. I'm just exploring different concepts and different things. And 
how that encourages me to open myself up to love and not equate vulnerability with weakness to not equate equate love with vulnerability love with weakness not to equate pain with i'm doing something wrong right so those are just some closing thoughts i probably need to finish up because my <clears throat> my voice is getting strained but I encourage you to follow me on TikTok. That has been a really big surprise for me that it has been a place where I feel like I am the most authentically myself apart from this podcast because it's all in one bucket. I did this 30-day TikTok challenge that was put together and for 30 days you had to post three times a day. And with work and my kiddo and trying to put meals together or stopping by and getting fast food, I'm just keeping it real. With all of that, when you have to post three times a day, you really have to do away with perfectionism and focus just on creativity. Is there something that interested me or lit me up or that I think is fun? Well, then let me do that. So... In this one bucket called TikTok, I have all the lip syncing 280 songs. I have some of the more serious talks like you would find on my podcast. And you have just really short musings. I post about Texas plants and flowers. It's more of a well-rounded portrait of who I am as opposed to Instagram. You know, I try to post just things that relate to, to that thing. <laughs> And so for the podcast, it has its own Instagram account. So I feel like I can only post things that relate to the podcast. And then I have one that are for more of my other professional profile apart from the podcast. So all of my writings, this ecstatic fork workshop that I'm going to be doing, that goes there. Um, but little things that aren't spiritual or whatever, I, I don't add them. And maybe I should, but... TikTok surprisingly has been a really welcoming container and environment for all of it, all of it together. So follow me on TikTok at Aprilific, or you can go to my website, Aprilific.com. I have on there several different offerings. If you haven't checked it out in a while, I do some tarot and oracle card readings where you can pose your question and send that to me. I can also do dream interpretations from that website, or you can go to the dreamtranslator.com. I would love to give you any type of insight or suggestions as to how to approach the dream if you needed help. So I think that's it for now. I'm trying to remember if there's anything I'm forgetting. I've already told you about the Ecstatic Forest Festival. Feel free to click on my affiliate link so that I get a a kickback that helps me pay for my vendor's table that I've purchased. So that is it for now. Thank you for listening if you've made it this far. And again, if you have any offering or service product that you would like to offer, you can be a sponsor for this podcast. Every little bit helps. One of the things that's been really cool, I only have one patron right now, but it has been such a blessing because that that amount each month it it adds up and it goes to helping me pay for my website and the domain and my calendly scheduling subscription all those things so it all adds up if you feel like you want to support the podcast in any way you can go on to the patreon patreon.com forward slash aprilific and become a five dollar a month or ten dollar a month supporter the ten dollar a month i have them called the thunder tier because a pack of dragons is called a thunder and i i really feel a strong dragon connection i've loved dragons so and with the ten dollar i am allowed by patreon to give you a one-time handmade welcome gift so that's what i I do. I usually crochet. I usually send you a handmade crocheted item. So hopefully that's 
a little extra perk to encourage you to join the support of the podcast if you found it at all helpful. And if you can, I have definitely been in situations where it would have felt very unresponsible of me to put money towards a certain project or person, even if I really loved what they were doing. And some people will say, oh, just trust or stretch yourself or you're investing in yourself with different products and things. And that's definitely true. I want you to feel into yourself because I have made some investments in myself that were some big ticket items. But if I were to do that every time someone else told me to hand them money because it was investing in myself, I don't know how, how, how well resourced I would be right now. So yeah, but anytime you feel that resonance inside you and you answer that call, then that's when you know that it is going to be met with success. So don't do it because I'm asking you to. <laughs> I am definitely not one to guilt anybody into doing something that they do not feel called to do. So, so yeah, even if you don't support the podcast financially, just by you listening is fantastic. Please also, if you would, spread word about it on social media, leave me a review. I believe on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, there are only two reviews that were written and one of them's from me. <laughs> Cheating the system. So, you know, there are different ways besides money that you could show some love. That or send me an email. Let me know what parts of the podcast you found really impactful or that resonated with you. That energetic component is huge. I will tell you that last week's podcast, I didn't hear back from anybody. <laughs> so I don't know that anyone listened, but even if they didn't, it's okay. I am finding a lot of benefit in putting words to my experience as I experience it. And it could, it's going to be this library. I think several people have told me this before, including Courtney, my one patron right now, how I am creating this library of resources for people who in the future might happen upon the podcast that was meant for them in that moment at the right time. So that's also what I trust is happening. Yeah. If you want to send me an email, you can send it to the sand boxpod at gmail.com or you can go to my website again aprilific.com and there should be a little microphone in the top corner somewhere that you can tap on and leave me a message it can be anonymous but i can share that on the podcast as a listener mail i would love to love to feature that so and that's it for now thank you for listening 